When you make a pod in Kubernetes, what happens behind the scenes? How do those Kubernetes components work together to bring that pod into fruition? My name is Whitney Lee. I'm on the cloud team here at IBM. So this is a cool exercise. It's kind of goes over all the basics of Kubernetes, but with the perspective of a pod being made. So at the basis of our system, we have our nodes. The nodes are the worker machines that, that back up the Kubernetes cluster. So in Kubernetes, there are two types of nodes. We have the control nodes. And in our case, we're going to do just one control node for simplicity's sake. But you, in a production level cluster, you'd want at least three control nodes. And then we have the compute nodes. So in our exercise here, we'll do two compute nodes. But um, you can have many, many compute nodes in a Kubernetes cluster. So let's talk about a use case where we want to make a pod. Let's say I'm the one making a pod. So here's me, my smile, long hair, haha, <laughs> my bangs. OK, so I'm going to make a pod in Kubernetes. And when I make that call with a cube control command, that's going to go into the Kubernetes cluster and hit the cube API server. So the Cube API server is the main management component of a Kubernetes cluster. Now the first thing that Kube, the Kube API server is going to do with my request to make a pod is it is going to authenticate it and validate it. So it's going to say, who are you? Do you have access to this cluster? Like, oh, you're Whitney. Cool. We know you. Come on in. Make a pod. So the next thing that happens is the Cube API server is going to write that pod to etcd. etcd is a key value data store that's distributed across the cluster, and it is the source of truth for the Kubernetes cluster. Word on the street is we have a really good IBM Cloud video about it. Um, so Cube API server writes that request to etcd. And then etcd will return when it has made a successful write. And then at that point, the Cube API server already is going to return to me that it's created. Even though not a lot has happened in our system yet. That's because at its core, Kubernetes in etcd has defined a desired state of what the system looks like. And then all the Kubernetes components that we're going to talk about today work together to make that desired state equal to the actual state. So now that we have the pod recorded in the desired state, it is as good as created as far as Kubernetes is concerned. The next component I want to talk about is the scheduler. The scheduler is keeping an eye out for workloads that need to be created. And, and what it's going to do is determine which node it goes on. But what it's doing in the short term is it's pinging our Cube API, API server at regular intervals to get a status of whether there are any workloads that need to be scheduled. So usually like five seconds. So this, the Cube scheduler is the scheduler, excuse me, is going to ping the Cube API server. Hey, do we have any workloads that need to be created? No? OK. How about now? Are there any workloads now? No? All right. How about now? Oh, Whitney has a pod that needs to get created. Let's do that. So now that the scheduler knows that pod needs to get created on one of our compute nodes, let's take a pause from this and talk about our compute nodes for a moment. Our compute nodes have three major components. One is a kubelet. The kubelet is how the compute node communicates with the control plane, or with specifically the Cube API server. So each, each compute node has a kubelet. So the kubelet is going to register the node with the cluster. It will send periodic health checks so that the Cube API server knows that our compute nodes are healthy. 
and it will also create and destroy workloads as directed by the Cube API server. Each of our compute nodes is also going to have a container runtime engine that's compliant with container runtime initiative. And so in the past, it's been Docker, but it could really be anything that's compliant. And then finally, it has cube, a cube proxy, which isn't needed to create our pod today. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. And the cube proxy is going to help the compute nodes communicate with one another if there are any workloads that span across more than one node. Just generally, it helps them communicate. OK, that said, now we have our scheduler. A scheduler is aware that we need to schedule Whitney's pod. What our scheduler is going to do is look at the available compute nodes. It's going to rule out any that are unsatisfactory, either because of limitations um, that maybe the cluster administrator set up, or maybe it just doesn't have enough space for my pod. And then of the ones that are left, it'll choose the best one to run the workload on, taking all of the factors into account. Once it has made that choice, does it schedule the workload? No. All it does is tell the Cube API server where it should go. Once the Cube API server knows where it should go, does it schedule the workload? No. What it does is it writes it to etcd. And then after the successful writes, then we have the desired state versus the actual state. And the Cube API server knows what it needs to do to make that desired state and the actual state meet the desired state. And what that is, is that's when the Cube API server is going to let the Cubelet know. Let's say the scheduler said we should run the pod on node 2. So that's when it's going to let the Cubelet know on node 2 we need to spin up a pod on this cluster. The Cubelet's going to work together with the container runtime engine and make a pod that has the appropriate container running inside. So we have made a pod on a Kubernetes cluster. But there's one more management piece I want to talk about. Let's consider a case where when I made the pod, I set the restart policy to always. And then let's say my pod, something happens and it goes down. How will the system know that I want a new pod to be created in its place? That is where the controller manager comes in. This is the last um, important component of Kubernetes. So the controller manager, it is made up of all of the controllers. So there are many controllers that are controlled by the controller manager. And in particular, the one that's going to help me make a new pod for me. I'm not doing anything at this point. My job is done up there. But um, the controller manager, it's the replication controller within the controller manager that's going to help with this task. So the controller manager, all the different controllers are watching different pieces of the Kubernetes system. The replication controller, just, just like the scheduler, these controllers are pinging the Cube API server at a regular basis to get an update on the actual state of the cluster to make sure the desired state and the actual state are the same as one another. So the replication controller sees, from contacting the Cube API server, sees that my pod is gone, and it will take the necessary steps to spin that pod back up or create a new pod, honestly, because pods are ephemeral. So in conclusion, all of these components are working together just to make my pod. And especially we have the Cube API server, the main management component of the cluster. We have etcd, our data store and our source of truth for the cluster. The scheduler that helps determine which of the compute nodes a workload should go onto. And the controller manager that is watching the desired state, the actual state and making sure it's the same as the desired state. Thank you. If you have questions, please drop us a line below. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, please like and subscribe. And don't forget, you can grow your skills and earn a badge with IBM Cloud Labs, which are free, browser-based, interactive Kubernetes labs.